from the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy. Oh, there it is, the guitar. I like to think it's Johnny Gilbert on that guitar. I'd love to think that. A little guitar solo by Johnny Gilbert. Interestingly enough, that music never used in syndication. Yeah, that's the guitar thing. People kept on saying to me, have you heard the guitar theme? Have you heard the guitar theme? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, I, I hadn't. But yeah, it's great. We've decided to use that the guitar version, the Johnny Gilbert on lead guitar version. For oh, Inside Jeopardy. Play it, Johnny. Yes, this is Inside Jeopardy, your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Michael Davies, joined by that other voice you hear, Sarah Foss, producer Sarah Foss, Clue Crew, Sarah here I am. What a week it's been. Thank you, everyone, for listening to our first ever Inside Jeopardy podcast. I got to say, in a world of social media, we heard so many nice comments from everyone. <laughs> Always good to hear. And it's just, it means a lot to us to have your support in this new endeavor with Jeopardy. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a lot coming up on this episode. We're going to have more game recaps. We're going to talk about the nine second chances we didn't get to last week. And we're going to announce at the end of this episode the Hall of Fame inductees, the first ever Yes, the inductees. inaugural class of inaugural 2022. Class. Yes, five of them are going to be inducted in the Hall of Fame a little later this fall. We're going to talk about all of that. And we're going to answer some of your questions. One of the things we promised is to answer the things that you were wondering about. So we'll take a few fan questions as well that you've submitted. Yeah, I announced a lot last week. Shocker. Uh, I think <laughs> inspired by that, some listeners started pitching me individual ideas. There was a fantastic tweet from David Maybury. Pitch to Embassy Davies. We do a Love Island slash Jeopardy crossover where I host the upcoming contestant pool who arrives in a carefully manipulated stream in a series of in or out practice sessions at my home. I give you Quiz Ranch. Let's set a meeting. Hashtag Jeopardy. I love it. Yeah, it does remind me of there was a while ago, I think that Lily... Uh, one eclectic mom and Buzzy were going back and forth talking about ideas uh, for sort of Jeopardy spin-off shows. And I jumped in and said, I'd program all of these ideas on a Jeopardy network. Uh, and we got a load of pitches. I remember we got a uh, Jeopardy Bake Off, uh, inspired, no doubt, by British Bake Off. There was Single Jeopardy, which was Jeopardy played for uh, singles. In some ways, Inside Jeopardy is a, is a result partly of that also, that I realized that we need an overall Jeopardy network with talk shows. I think originally I conceived this as Good Morning Jeopardy. Yeah. Well, now you can listen to it any time of the day. So yeah. it's just Inside Jeopardy at any time of the day. I love when Buzzy and Lily were going back and forth. You know, he was going to help her. They were going to go shopping. They were going to do all sorts of fashion Jeopardy. So you never know what could come up next. Lots of other comments about Inside Jeopardy last week. We do appreciate all of the feedback, uh, whether it was just positive or constructive, which we always enjoy. Some of the comments around the Masters tournament, which I spoke about, like my fondest dream to build a a Masters league in prime time to do it live. You know, as you know, I, I talk about that at absurdum. Yeah, you nearly got choked up when speaking about it, yeah, I remember. I, know. I love it. There was a comment on the Jeopardy Reddit from a, a Redditor, uh, Rehan, I believe is, uh, is their name. I really want to see James Holtzauer compete again now that Ken has retired. James is arguably the best Jeopardy contestant. It would be awesome to see James uh, versus Matt and Slash or James versus Amy. I'm not sure if they would invite him back. And if they do, I don't know if he would accept. He seems to have moved on from Jeopardy. Let me just clarify, on behalf of everyone at Jeopardy, we love James Holtzauer. We very much are still uh, in contact, very much a friend of the program. And I got to tell you, I can't imagine doing Masters without James Holtzauer. So he would definitely be invited back from us. And I, I believe, I believe he would accept. Yes, some more exciting news, actually. James is going to be a part of our Jeopardy! Honors this fall. So uh, he's definitely a part of the Jeopardy! family, and we're looking forward to welcoming him back in any capacity. And also Ken. I mean, Ken does consistently say he's retired uh, from playing. I wouldn't close the door as the commissioner of Major League Jeopardy. I wouldn't close the door completely from Ken playing in the future, but he seems to have closed the door himself. Yeah, well, we did make some rules in the past, not that rules can't be broken, but that once a contestant had hosted the program, they could no longer compete because they had seen behind the curtain, if you will. Yeah, that's producer Sarah giving me a disapproving look. But I'm telling you, it's like if Ken is the greatest of all time, it's kind of like Arnold Palmer who tees off at the Masters. I certainly, if Ken came to me desperately and said, this is it, 
I still want to play Jeopardy. I cannot believe that I would completely close the door on Ken playing any form of Jeopardy at any point in the future. All right. What about Buzzy Cohen? He hosted our Tournament of Champions. What do we say about Buzzy? I feel like Buzzy should be able to play Jeopardy again in some form at some point. All right. You've heard it here first, folks. Michael Davies, executive producer, commissioner, if you will, can change the rules at will. (laughs) That's not true. Okay. (laughs) That really isn't true. Okay. So last week, it's our first week of repeats. Yes. Um, A fun week of shows. Fascinating. I was just uh, telling uh, Sarah before the podcast, I sat down and watched them all yesterday. Very interesting for me, especially these first two episodes, the early episodes, because I wasn't the executive producer or even the interim executive producer of Jeopardy yet. And they're both shows that haven't, they aired in my time, but they were produced before my time. Fascinating for me to see it. Monday's episode, um, Madam Odio against Carlo, Tracy Pitzel. She's coming back for Second Chance. That's this right. Is an interesting thing. It was one of our first opportunities to feature one of our Second Chance competitors. So you saw her last Monday. Yeah, it was our sixth game of season 38. Mayim came out at the beginning, great open. A really strong show uh, throughout. One of the things I noticed first of all though, in watching it, was one of the first changes I made when I came in is Mayim would walk out and she would look over towards Johnny Gilbert and say, thank you, Johnny, and then turn to the camera and deliver the open. Now, Johnny, I don't know if this is a big reveal to the audience, Johnny, isn't there in the audience for anybody coming to watch us tape jeopardy right now audiences are back which is amazing uh johnny isn't there in the studio you produce all of the opens with johnny sir i do yeah i'm i call myself fake johnny um no one will ever be the voice of jeopardy but i fill in for him on tape days and then the associate director chloe corwin and i meet up with him after we tape the shows he's got his studio j we call it in his home it's all set up We call him up, and then he reads all of the opens for the show, correctly and beautifully pronouncing each of the contestants' names, and that is what actually goes into the show. And I loved that you made that call, Michael, because obviously we want to, you know, definitely acknowledge Johnny, but you felt it wasn't authentic, that we were pretending he was in the audience. Yeah, I think on a show about fact, it wasn't right that we were looking over to an imaginary Johnny. And instead, you know, we thank him because we should thank him at the beginning of the episode. But we thank him right down the camera, right down the lens, because we know he watches every single episode. He does. He streams it from home and he is right there as if he's with us in the audience. And so we thank him, but we look straight in the camera. Yeah, I loved that. I love that change. Okay, let's skip ahead to Wednesday, because this for me is when it gets really interesting. This was a show. Oh, (laughs) and it was my first ever episode in the control room producing it. And what a program to be my first. Yeah, I had just actually said to Maya, you know, because this was her first long streak, and I said, you'll be surprised. You'll think someone's going to go on forever, and all of a sudden, their streak will end, and you won't be ready for it. And moments later, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, it was Madame Odio, Jessica Stevens, as we said last week, in some ways the inspiration uh, for Second Chance, and Jonathan Fisher, who, of course, will be returning for Tournament Champions uh, this fall. An amazing, amazing game. Close throughout i noticed a few things being my first show i was kind of laughing at myself actually there was the open lots of statistics in the open uh talking about ken's winning streak and and showing where matt was in relation to it you know language throughout i think we had a throw to break where it was in the context of madame odio's winning streak uh this would be regarded as a very close game yes and then at the end i could tell as it was going close in double jeopardy as we got towards final you know, me screaming at the director, three shot, three shot, three shot, three shot, so that we could constantly see all three contestants and we can really monitor what's going on, where the horse race is between all three players. Yeah, that's another great contribution you made where you can really see, you can feel it side by side. You can know how close the scores are. And in the end, um, you know, Matt did prevail, but we will be seeing all three of the competitors from that game live to play another game, which people pointed out on social media had not happened since a three-way tie years ago. So pretty, pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, the two consecutive daily doubles hit by Jonathan, so crucial in Double Jeopardy. Got the first one wrong, but he then bounced back and immediately got the uh, second one. They were huge in that game for him. Okay, Thursday's show, a wonderful program. Ren, Emily, and Tyler Road. I feel some pressure to say something about Tyler because he's been on Twitter very excited for this second episode of Inside Jeopardy, waiting for all the stat breakdown that we're going to give him about his own episode. I'm not sure we have anything. We're joined by Michael Harris, uh, the enabler 
senior researcher, <laughs> gameplay analyst. What do we have on Tyler Hi, from this episode, Michael? Well, what we have for Tyler, uh, he actually ran the uh, foul play sports category. And as all of you know, sports categories on Jeopardy can be pretty difficult regardless of what they are. But uh, he ran that category in the uh, double Jeopardy round. And um, he eventually worked his way into the contention for uh, being competitive in that game. Yeah, absolutely. The Marines him, which he got in final. Uh, none of the other two got it. That was a very, very good answer. And then Friday, you know, finished off the week. Another great episode. This is when Tyler lost to Tony Freitas. He looks like someone. He looks like a famous actor. I can't think who it is who Tony Freitas looks like. But he does look like someone. Let us know on Twitter. But yeah, that was a great week. I love watching uh, these episodes. You know, it's very different running these, our favorite episodes instead of running these repeats of tournaments, but we don't have enough tournaments this year. Plus, we just felt it was a really fun thing to do to feature these contestants who we're going to see uh, in the postseason. And now we move on to second chance, our second nine. We start off with Pam Schoenberg. Now, she's a dentist online dress seller from South Salem, New York. She played one of the most competitive games we saw against Amy Schneider. And she went up against her in Amy's 10th game. Yeah, so get out your brackets again, everyone. So Pam Schoenberg um, had 24 correct response average, and she bested Amy in that game with four more correct responses. Uh, With a solid buzzer attempts around 35, Pam is going to be a serious competitor to watch. Yeah, former squash player, I believe, Pam Pam Schoenberg, a competitive squash player. And she came, she was ready to play. We thought she was going to take Amy down for a second. Yeah, and an interesting thing, we thought this game was so wonderful, such a great competition. It's actually the episode we submitted for the Emmys this past oh, year. Interesting. And we won. So we did. go Pam, go Amy, and, and go Chris Fisher. All right, next up we have Doe Park, a reporter from Minneapolis, Minnesota. He also competed against Amy Schneider, this time in her fourteenth game, and he was in one of only six games. That was not a runaway for Amy. Doe comes into second chance with above average buzzer attempts at 43, which shows a high level of confidence. And if his opponent hadn't been Amy, who knows how far he might have gone. He could have had his own streak. His second chance opponents might find the answer to that the hard way, folks. Next up, we have Renee Russell, a branch office administrator from Baltimore, Maryland. Now, Renee competed against 23 game winner and upcoming TOC player, Matea Roach. Yeah, her general stats might seem a bit misleading to some of you because she only had 28 buzzer attempts, but that could mean she was kind of cautious in her gameplay, or maybe she was just uneasy with the categories that she was given on that day. But that didn't stop her from finishing the DJ around with $21,000, which is second strongest showing of all our second chance contestants. Could be a dark horse player and someone to watch. Next up, we have Sarah Snyder, a middle school humanities teacher from Fishers, Indiana, another strong competitor against Matea Roach. With 21 correct response averages, Sarah only missed two clues that she rang in. She has a really strong 38 buzzer attempts, the average for TOC players. She led Matea after the uh, double Jeopardy round with a huge margin, but was thwarted by a final Jeopardy clue. She's a solid player, and her fellow opponents will have to be on their toes because she was almost a giant killer. Next up, we have Aaron Gullius, a community college history instructor from Grand Blank, Michigan. He competed against our 16-game winner and upcoming TOC player Ryan Long in Ryan's 11th game. Uh, 24 correct response average. Aaron matches fellow opponent Pam Schoenberg. At 41 buzzer attempts, it demonstrates a high level of security in his abilities. And he actually led Ryan Long going into Final Jeopardy. But a daring wager, or lack thereof, cost him a chance to win. He's definitely going to want to make up for a missed opportunity in second chances, so watch out. We have Tom Philippos next, a writing professor from Forest Hills, New York. He was another contestant who played against Ryan Long, this time in Ryan's 15th game. Oh, what can we say about Tom? He is (laughs) full of confidence. He had 44 attempts at the buzzer. That means he really wanted to get in because he knew his stuff, responding correctly 20 out of 20 times. A daring wager in Final Jeopardy and an incorrect response was his downfall, though he had the edge over champion Ryan Long. He bet a little too much, and even though they both missed Final Jeopardy, Ryan obviously walked away with the game. It's definitely going to be a race for the buzzer for Tom's opponents, and if he gets in, I wouldn't count on him getting it wrong. Yep, he wore a half zip. Oh, Lily, you heard it here. You know it. 
Next up, we have Sadie Goldberger, an interpreter from Columbia, Maryland. Now, many will remember Sadie. She competed against Megan Waxpress, who you'll also be seeing in the TOC in what was Megan's fifth game. Sadie had a strong game with 32 buzzer attempts. She led Megan going into Final Jeopardy and an incomplete written response, and the game went to Megan instead. Yeah, and this is one of those um, things that we wanted to bring up because it talks about what happens for us as judges in the game. When it comes to Final Jeopardy, you have to finish your response. And we could actually go back and watch the tape. The style pens that we use are timed out to 30 seconds with the music, and they stop working as soon as the the time is up. In Sadie's case, we did go back. We stopped the show. We went back and watched it repeatedly. We could see that she was going through each of the letters, and she wrote a T, a U, a B, an M, an A, and we knew she had not begun to write an N. Again, I think she wished, in in hindsight, she had just gone for Tubman and not written out Harriet Tubman, but she just didn't end up having enough time. We talked to Sadie. It was a tough ruling. She played a great game, and we're so happy to be able to welcome her back for Second Chance. Yeah, absolutely. We should say that the judging process, there are a few people who are involved in all judging uh, decisions, including uh, the Outside Standards and Practices um, Agency. Ultimately, I suppose the final call is mine, but I'm not sure I've even had to employ that at any point because we tend to get to a sort of a quorum of agreement between myself, you, Sarah, Billy and Michelle, our head writers, Rocky Schmidt, uh, Lisa Brofman, two incredibly experienced producers also on the show. You know, precedent is an interesting thing, and I see this talked a lot about um, on the boards. Of course, I haven't been here for uh, 38 years uh, I so I don't know every ruling that's ever been made it's one of my big questions is is what is the precedent we have cleaned up a few of the rules uh, in the off season and, and done some work on that maybe that's something which we'll talk about going forward and certainly within the episodes that I'm overseeing I'm trying to find some way that we can consistently uh, make decisions and, and have benchmarks I know that there are often things cited from you know, seasons of yore and the way things were judged. It's tough for me to go and deal with that. But we do always, we give real time and we we attempt to look like any uh, judgment. None of this is ever perfect, but we attempt to apply some sound uh, logic and and equity in the decisions uh, we make. Anyway, as you said, we are delighted to welcome Sadie back on a second chance. Next up, we have Alicia O'Hare, a social worker from Long Beach, New York. Now, Alicia competed against three-time champion Young Shin Wong. No one can forget his celebratory motions as he won, and she came up against him in his second game. Yeah, Alicia has champion caliber stats. Uh, she went 25 for two in responses, and among her second chance contestants, only Jeff Smith matches her. And a strong buzzer attempt at 42 puts her among the best of the field. Yes, very much so. Our final second chance competitor, Isaac Applebaum from Stanford. No one can forget Isaac. He came in fourth place in our inaugural Jeopardy! National College Championship in primetime. He won his semifinal game, but only the top three scores of the four semifinal winners could advance to the finals. So as a result, Isaac was the first officially named second chance contestant back in February when you, Michael Davies, first teased this this brand new competition. Oh, Isaac had such a great spirit. Um, he was just shy of having an accumulated score to make the finals, as you mentioned, Sarah. With buzzer attempts at 30 and 34, he's one of the only second chances or the only second chance uh, competitor who actually has two games worth of stats going into um uh, into this. Uh, He's very competitive. His youth could give him an edge in some areas, or it might be Achilles heel in others, depending upon what the categories are. His opponents will definitely have to keep an eye on Isaac, because when he is back behind the podium, it will be game on with all of his energy. Yeah, a very, very intense player, um, and also a lovely, lovely young man. Uh, I think he reduced mine to tears almost with uh, a story about his mom. And an interesting tweet this week from our JNCC champion. He said, so if I go into the Tournament of Champions and I win it, I'll be the first person to go in and, you know, I will have never lost. And people came to Isaac's defense and they said, well, technically, if Isaac makes it through second chance and he ends up with the TOC, he wouldn't have a loss either. So got to love our supportive community. OK, well, we're racing the clock a little bit because we're actually recording Inside Jeopardy during lunch break on a tape day. And we've got two more shows uh, to make this afternoon. Uh, we should answer some questions. Yes, we promised we would do it. And just so you know, if you want to get your questions answered inside Jeopardy podcast at gmail.com. 
Our first question comes from Gary Fanning. He asks, Dear Jeopardy, after Double Jeopardy, do the players get any coaching or advice on what type or amount of wager they should make? For example, if you wager $2,001, it could make you win by a dollar. Well, Gary, I can tell you the answer is no. And for many reasons, one, it's really up to the contestants and it's all subjective. What we could suggest is a great wager. Someone else could say was a terrible wager. We see all of you commenting on wagers all the time. So no, no advice is given. All that happens is they put their wagers in. Once they have five minutes to put those wagers in, we do set a clock. And if you run out of time, well, you don't get to wager. So you have to put it in that time. But we do give them a 30-second warning. And then once they have put in their wager, we clear their screens and we give them a who or a what. This allows them not to have to think about putting things in the form of a question in those tense moments of Final Jeopardy. So hope that answers your question. We did get another question. Looking forward to Inside Jeopardy. What are your favorite behind the scenes stories? That's come from Ian Hayden. We get it from a lot of other people. They want behind the scenes stories. That sort of is what we see as the point entirely of Inside Jeopardy is to give you a lot of behind the scenes uh, information. So I I hope we're doing a good job on that and we will continue to do that. We're going to continue to bring you interviews uh, over the coming weeks with some of the people who make Jeopardy, some of the most important figures in the world of Jeopardy, both past, present and future. Okay, Sarah, on to your brainchild, your baby, Jeopardy Honours. Um, We've been receiving a lot of questions about it. Uh, We announced Jeopardy Honours during last week's episode. Ahead of Tournament of Champions, we will host a special ceremony here on the Sony lot to recognize some of our most memorable players and performances from the previous season. And for the first time in Jeopardy's 58-year history, we will also announce the inaugural Jeopardy Hall of Fame class, the inductees for 2022. Yes, and today is the day we want to reveal who we have chosen. Now, in future years, we're going to be inducting great champions of the show, but this year we really wanted to focus on the pioneers of the program, those people who have greatly contributed to the legacy of the show. Okay, the first two inductees in the Hall of Fame, Merv and Julian Griffin. Their son, Tony Griffin, will be in attendance to accept. Merv, obviously, a man who I used to work for, started my career at Merv Griffin Enterprises. This means a lot to me uh, personally, and obviously this show simply would not exist without both of them. Yeah, Julianne actually is really credited with coming up with the idea for Jeopardy, which was originally called What's the Question? But as story goes, they were on a flight back from New York City, And she could tell he was working. And she said, you know, what are you working on? One of those knowledge-based games. And he said, well, yeah, since the quiz show scandals, the networks won't won't let you do those anymore. So she said, well, why don't you give them the answers and make people come up with the questions? Merv was confused. He thought that was the problem in the first place. She said, okay, the answer is 5,280. Merv thinks a minute. He says, the question is how many feet in a mile? Well, there you go. They kept going for hours. That's how this show was born. And look at us, almost 59 years later, a simple game of questions and answers. So excited to honor both of them. Tony will be here. And a fun story about Tony, Merv wrote the Think Music as a lullaby to Tony when he was a child. It took him less than a minute. And Merv has admitted that that little tune has made him a fortune. Wow. (laughs) Amazing, amazing stuff. The third inductee. Uh, No surprise here. Perhaps you could talk about this a little bit, Sarah. Alex Trebek, his wife, Jean, will be in attendance to accept. Yeah, we're so excited that Jean Trebek will be here. I I love Alex. I almost love Jean just as much. She is just such a wonderful woman. They have such an incredible family. Obviously, Jeopardy, we can't think of it with Alex hosting it since 1984 for 37 seasons. He is the heart and soul of this show. Ken and Mayim both, I think, admire him and look to take tips from him. Even still today, I know Ken will look at old episodes and try to get tips from Alex. So can't think of the Hall of Fame without Alex Trebek. Yes, and we shoot the show on the Alex Trebek stage. Uh, I personally got to make the phone call to the next inductee to uh, let him know that we were going to be putting him in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Harry Friedman, a man who is the definition in my mind of the producer. He is everything I think of as being a a television producer, a brilliant man, uh, presided over this show for so, so long. Harry joined our show back in 1997 after being an EP of Wheel of Fortune. You know, he's credited with so many of the changes in the show, doubling the dollar amounts, you know, extending the limit where you could win more than five shows, paving the way for Ken Jennings. I said to him on the phone that (laughs) unless you'd done that, we just would not have the season of the Super Champions. We wouldn't be able to do any of the things we're doing now without that simple rule change. 
more close to my heart, the Clue Crew was Harry's idea as well to bring these video clues to the show. So I have a job thanks to Harry Friedman. He went on to get a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame back in 2019. He retired from our show in 2020, but he is still so much a part of all of it. So we're really excited to be able to honor him as well. And our final recipient, the one, the only, the announcer of our show from day one, Johnny Gilbert. I got to make this call, and he is the only remaining member of the Jeopardy team that has been here since day one in 1984. Johnny is not just the voice of the show, but the heart of the show. He will be here to accept his Hall of Fame award. Can't wait to give him a big hug in person. We love our Johnny Gilbert. I should say that, you know, when I uh, went on my own Twitter yesterday and said that we would be announcing this inaugural Hall of Fame class, the one name that was sort of suggested to me when people were trying to guess who would be in there was Art Fleming. I would love uh, to get in communication with those around him, those close to him, and talk about how we might honor him at some point in the future. Absolutely. The original host back in the 60s, the OG Jeopardy host. And we're going to have other awards too. So it's going to be our inaugural Hall of Fame, but we're also going to have our Jeopardy honors, similar to the NFL honors. We're going to be awarding such fun things like best dress this season, we're going to need your help, Lily. Uh, best name depiction, celebration of the year, sportsmanship, so many fun awards to give out. So we cannot wait for our first ever event. And what date is that? That will be hosted on September 19th, the eve of our Tournament of Champions tapings. Uh, are we gonna sell, I should know the answer to this. Are we selling tickets? Are people coming to the audience? Like, is this uh, going to be an audience event? Probably not with that. No, it's going to be rules. outdoor on our Sony lot. We're, of course, going to have all of our TOC participants. The two winners of Second Chance will be there, along with some staff and crew. And we're going to put it out on social, right? We're going to shoot this for YouTube. We're yes, gonna, we're going to have we're this gonna edit it all together. You're going to see the full show on our Jeopardy! YouTube channel. Okay, that's it for this week. Uh, next week... Wow, this is going to be a long expected announcement. We're going to reveal the Tournament of Champions contestants. I think maybe the bigger thing, we're going to reveal the new structure of the Tournament of Champions. And we will have a very special guest, none other than 2017 Tournament of Champions winner and 2021 Tournament of Champions host and friend of the show, friend of mine, Buzzy Cohen will be here. No one knows TOC better than Buzzy. He's going to break it all down with us. That will be dropping next Monday night. You will not want to miss it. Okay, well, as the music kicks back in, Johnny Gilbert on the guitar. That's it for today's episode. As always, uh, please make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Rate us, leave us a comment, share it across social. Follow us at Jeopardy on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and on YouTube. See you next week. The clue is, if you liked that video, click this button. What is the subscribe button? 